All right, guys, bang, bang. I have a very, very special treat for you today. I have Dan here. Thank you so much for doing this, sir. Hey, Pomp, happy to be here, finally. Absolutely. Let's jump in real quick. Uh, give us kind of a quick overview of your background, and then we will get to the conversation that everyone wants to hear, which is gold and Bitcoin. Okay. Um, well, you know, I've been through this a few times already. I think most people know uh, a little bit about my background. I was in the hedge fund business for 25 years as a global macro uh, PM. Um, worked uh, early in my career with Julian Robertson at Tiger and then Michael Steinhardt. Um, also then uh, a little later on, worked with Steve Cohen at Stack for 10 years and then Stan Druckenmiller at Duquesne um, and then back with Steve again. Uh, along the way, uh, focused on just about everything outside of uh, specific uh, equities. Um, you know, that would be commodities and currencies, uh, emerging markets, etc. In 06, when I was working with Druck, we launched, a, I was very focused on agriculture then. Uh, we, we launched a, a company called Agcoa, which ended up becoming the largest private farmland REIT in the U.S., uh, we sold it in uh, 2013 to the Canadian Pension Fund System. But for seven years, uh, we built up this um, uh, uh, portfolio of farms out in uh, wheat, corn, soy producing farms out in uh, the Midwest, mostly in, in the Mississippi Delta and, and in Nebraska. So that was, you know, that was a case where I took a macro idea that I focused on for the portfolio through positions in in grains and then applied that idea to starting a business. Um, did the same thing in 08, 09 uh, with physical gold. Uh, had been trading gold in the 90s or positioning um, and then got very bullish in 08. Worried about you know banking sy systemic risk. Wanted to hone some physical gold outside of the banking system. I mean, to have it stored outside the banking system. Couldn't find a really, I would say legit AAA you know, way to do it. You know, you had guys on the internet uh, I've said sort of like crazy Eddie type guys selling you physical gold or you had guys, you know, with a, a P.O. box in the Caymans. So um, set out with a partner to start a company called Gold Bullion International. Uh, my partner there is still the CEO. Uh, today, it's 11 years later. The business is uh, really flourishing this year. Uh, it's, it's just been a great business. Um, over, uh, over 40 people. We've done, uh, we've, we have over 300,000 clients, uh, done over a million trades, and we're the third largest vaulter now of gold out in the world outside of the max. Um, and so uh, I really know the physical gold business. Uh, I, 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 you know, I sometimes, it, it takes a lot for me to sort of hold back, especially on Twitter. We'll get into this a little later because I am coming from a, a different place of knowledge. I mean, I, I, I know this business anyway. So, um, and then, uh, in 2014, that gold business integrated with bit reserve, which today is the uphold wallet. And we were the first place that you could buy and sell physical gold to buy and sell Bitcoin and ripple. So that was sort of my intro into, uh, the Bitcoin world. Uh, and then in 2019, uh, the company partnered with Equity Trust to offer an IRA, and we were the second place in the U.S. where you could trade eight different cryptocurrencies um, in your IRA. And we also partnered with DCG. Uh, I've known Barry, you know, eight years or so on, on the other side. So we built that platform, DCG, of course, doing the execution and Equity Trust in the, you know, facing the client, but we're, we were the ones who sort of built that architecture. So that pulled me more into the world. And then in Q1, Q2, 19, what happened was, you know, the, the price had collapsed from uh, 19 down to four. And as a macro guy, look, you know that either it's a bust, right, after a blow off, or it was a big opportunity. And I had been making little bits of money in it, not a lot, um, and then I just sort of, I did the whole rabbit hole thing. I, I said, this is the time I did six months really of, uh, 10 hours a day of reading podcasts, uh, you know, re everything just totally immersive. And it sort of resulted in that interview I did with Raul Powell last summer about Bitcoin. And that was sort of like my kind of entry into the world. I mean, I, 
I didn't even do Twitter at that point. And Raul says to me, Dan, just give me a Twitter account and like people will follow up with questions. And so I just, I had had an account that I'd set up, but I'd never used it, didn't know how to use it. Anyway, I, that was sort of my uh, sort of entry uh, into the into this world. And, you know, of course, as you know, the entire Bitcoin world lives on Twitter. I tell people it, it's not New York, it's not Silicon Valley, it's not Hong Kong, it's, it lives on Twitter. And of course, because it lives on Twitter, we know you are one of the guys, uh, I, I don't know, not gatekeepers per se, but you're one of the, you know, I just think key, key people in the space. You connect so many different people. And I, I'm thrilled to be here. And I know we've been trying to do it for, for about a year just because I, I, I guess in a way, I think you reflect the zeitgeist. That's how I, I see it from like, a, you know, from the top down, like if people say to me, who are five people I have to follow or who, whose daily piece that you write, uh, you're definitely the hardest, man, man, hardest working man in, in Bitcoin. There's no blockchain, cryptocurrency, whatever you call it. I don't think anybody would dispute that. <laughs> I appreciate the kind yeah. words. And uh, for those that don't know, uh, in March and April of this year, when all of the economic chaos was kind of going on and there was lots of uncertainty, uh, you were one of a very select few number of people that basically I was like begging to get on the phone. I was like, help me understand what is going on right now. And, uh, and you nailed it, man. You, uh, you were all over it. And so uh, that experience definitely paid off. Yeah, that was, you know what, that was really fun because Look, when you've been in the markets for 30 years, you're used to, you know, selling climaxes and panics and this and that. And you see it in different places around the world. And March was really bad. But I can remember that one day in March when it gapped down, the Bitcoin gapped down through like six, five, it was six and then five. And I started getting all of these messages from all these people that like, Dan, you were so wrong. You don't know anything. And I put this tweet out like, listen, is the only time, and I'm against the cursing on Twitter just because I, I, you know, you got to, but it was the only time on Twitter I said, what is it? I said, STFU, right? This is like the bond, this is like, it, this is the only really truly freely trading market. Basically, this is it, right? Like, this is the bottom. This is not, you know, I was getting bombarded all over the place. And, you know, I, I just, um, nothing really had changed. And, we, you know, anyway, it was, it was a great moment to be involved in. And then in the weeks after, I mean, you and I did talk a lot about the dollar um, because that was the high. And that was part of what we were talking about was that um, the Federal Reserve would sacrifice the dollar before the equity market and, and the asset market. And so that was another um, meaning they would have preferred the doll that they would let the dollar go down as much as they needed to, as long as it ended up supporting the equity market. Right. So, um, yeah, that was a very exciting time. And I think a lot of guys in the space, uh, sort of became more macro after mm -hmm. that. Right. I Absolutely. Mean, yeah. How, let's start the conversation just around gold and Bitcoin with how do you right now, if you know, one of your global macro uh, friends called you up and they said, uh, look, we, I want to understand this, Dan, like how would you describe your thesis on gold and your thesis on Bitcoin to them? Yeah. Well, you know, the macro guys for the most part know why and how to uh, execute and position in gold and you know, you saw Tudor Jones's letter this summer, which was, a, I think, you know, one of the two or three most important uh, events in the space. Uh, you know, he had a, he has a significant position in gold, um, you know, and you can read his eight page paper, which I think is, is pretty good, gives you a good sense. And then, of course, Druck uh, as well came out a few days ago and, and, and mentioned a position in gold. Uh, and so that really doesn't need so much explain, uh, explaining. People get that, look, the the balance sheets of uh, central banks have been exploding. Uh, you know, M2 is up 25% year over year. And, you know, it's really not been up over 10% at any period. Rates are zero globally. There's huge injections of li liquidity going on uh, by all the major central banks. So I don't, that's not really, you know, that doesn't really need explanation. I think it's a little more uh, it's a little more difficult to explain Bitcoin because um, to own gold is to own uh, you know is to is to be short fiat right and so there's also this paper 
hard asset dichotomy, which really resonates with sort of more traditional uh, in, in investment managers, meaning they get there's paper, they get that there's an unlimited amount of paper, right? Or it, there will be, and that there's more or less a finite amount of gold and that it's hard, you can hold it, uh, you know, with 1% a year increase in supply or whatever, it's versus all the other assets out there in the world, it's finite, right? And I know the Bitcoiners are constantly saying, oh, gold, it's not finite, you can find it in the, the asteroid or whatever insanity that you want to come up with, but more or less. And, and I want to get into this because uh, e even though uh, uh, I do have great respect for your work, uh, I do think that the piece that you wrote a few days ago uh, sort of really inspired this. And, I, and, and we've talked about this a bit before the show, gold versus Bitcoin doesn't end in coexistence. And it's something that, you know, I really don't believe that's true. And I think one of the themes, if, there, if you'd say there's one theme that's consistent that I conti continue to put out on Twitter is that you really have to own both. And I want to clarify that though, because, and we'll, we'll, we'll and, and that's because, look, there's no question that Bitcoin is going to outperform gold. Mm -hmm. So I think people should stop talking on Twitter about it's bad. Price, you, you, you're, you're, saying, it? you're saying specifically uh, that Bitcoin from like a price appreciation. From a price standpoint. appreciation, okay. it is the fastest horse. It will be the fastest horse. We can you can spend hours explaining why, but I just or or not. Um, I think it's um, and and, I, and the way I think about it is in the next sort of five years I could see gold at four thousand, so that's a double. But if gold's at four thousand, Bitcoin is probably somewhere between three hundred and five hundred thousand. So that's a twenty thirty x. Well, it was from last week. It's still I mean it's about a twenty twenty thirty x, and so. I don't really think that that anyone in the gold world even who, you know, even Tudor Jones is, is he's his fastest horse. They're not going to debate that. So I don't, you know, I don't, you know, I, so and if you're a little, if you're a, a small investor, um, you know, you may you may say, well, I don't need gold. I just want the one that's going to perform uh, the best over a bunch of years. OK. But gold has certain characteristic characteristics and traits today that I don't think I'm not sure people are are aware of. And like, so why why bother with gold at all? You use the blockbuster and Netflix analogy, right? And I think that's actually the wrong analogy because okay. you and also and Sailor too, by the way, who I love to death, but. Um, you know, you come from a technologist background, mm -hmm. right? And so you look at it and you say, Bitcoin is new technology, gold is old technology. Okay, so there is some truth to that. There is some truth to that. But that's not, that's not why gold is important today or why it will be in the future. So, um, okay, so what is, you know, what is... Uh, What's important so about gold let's, for people? Hold on. Yeah, because let, I, okay. let, let's start with gold itself, right? In right. terms so of like, like why is gold important that, today? Right. So one of the things is um, gold is tremendous liquidity, right? It's an $11 trillion, $12 trillion uh, total market uh, value. Bitcoin is still only $350 billion. So mm -hmm. if you are an institution, let's say you're the, as an example, this Norwegian oil fund, they have a trillion dollars. They want to put 5% to work. Uh, in, let's say, a non-fiat asset that is scarce, okay, they can't do Bitcoin. They can do $50 billion of gold in less than a week. I mean, and if you, I mean, you can really accumulate that, right? It trades $50 trillion in volume a year, right? Versus, let's say, 3 to $4 trillion in Bitcoin slash all the other cryptocurrencies. So, in terms of trading volume, uh, it, it's much bigger, okay? But gold, and I think a lot of people are missing this, um, is just now entering a new phase. It is just now entering a bull market. And I might even argue that this coming up is gold's first bull market. And I say this because 
Um, and again, I did a longer interview in March on this, it's on YouTube, but I say this because we've never had, um, uh, we've never had zero rates or negative real rates uh, for this long. I think that the, the bond portion of all of these traditional asset uh, managers portfolio, okay, has now become irrelevant. So let's just say you have $200 trillion in assets out there, or even $100 trillion owned by pension funds, insurance companies, all these guys. And they have these 70-30 portfolios, right? So you're talking about 70 trillion, I'm sorry, 70 percent uh, uh, in, uh, uh, yeah, 70 trillion in, in equity or assets, you've got 30 sitting in government bonds, just in that one cohort, right? Those bonds do not act as a hedge to their portfolio anymore. They're sitting at 50 basis points, right? They cannot go below zero. If we have a slowdown in the next few years and the Fed has to come in again and take rates negative uh, in the front end and inject liquidity, um, those bonds will not appreciate to offset declines on the asset side of the portfolio, okay? They're in big trouble. And I've said this on Twitter, I've said it you know, a few times that the biggest question that people will have, traditional asset managers in the 2020s to answer is what am I gonna do with all of those government bonds or even like you know, corporate bonds that, are, that used to yield five that are now yielding one and a half or two because they've gone out the risk spectrum. One of the things that they will do, and they have not done it yet, is to move into gold, okay? And so I don't know even if you're aware of this, but the institutional allocation to gold is less than 2% globally, okay? It cannot be over for gold before it has even started. So when you say Bitcoin and gold can't coexist, that makes no sense to me because the move into gold hasn't happened yet. The move into Bitcoin will come after that. And I know some people will say, oh no, smart people will just jump over the gold step and they'll just go right to the Bitcoin, right? Well, it's too early for that. And also, you know, the mentality of people in that traditional asset world, they're way far away from owning Bitcoin. I mean, I know from uh, when you were, uh, you know, as a private equity uh, slash VC investor, you speak to some of these institutions and there are many of them that are years and years away. You know, we talk about the ones who are allocating now, uh, you know, uh, who, who understand it now and oh, the institutions are coming, but it's, it's the top 1%, right? 90% of them, Still, I just got a message today. Uh, it's not a proven valid technology. How many times have you heard of that? So those people are sitting with all of those bonds, okay? And from 1980 until today, every time we've had a slowdown, the bonds offset losses on their equities, okay? For the first time ever, that's over. And so why move to gold? Because they're going to move 5% or 10% of their portfolio to gold because gold does not have a limit on the upside when central banks are in balance sheet expansion mode. Right? Why have so many institutions not put assets like historically, right? So over the last two, five, 10 years, why have they kept that allocation at 2% or lower? It's actually, it's, I mean, it's pretty much zero for almost all of them. And then a few of them are like five and 5% 5 or whatever. So it averages out to like one or two. You know, it's just like anything. Um, gold was pegged until 71. And, you know, it, did, it didn't exist as a market from 33 to 71. So, it, I mean, it didn't trade. It was pegged. The 70s bull market in gold was really just about a release from a peg. I wouldn't even say it was, you know, no one... It was a trading asset. I don't think that people thought of, maybe they thought they'd have a little bit of it, but remember, it peaked in 1980, okay, and went into a bear market for 20 years. Gold price was declining for 20 years. So if there was somebody out there who thought gold should be in your portfolio in circa 1978, by 1988, 
he was, you know, he was proven wrong or, you know, and even, and then by 90, by 98, you know, he was dead on the ground. And then in 2000, I think it was 2000, you had the Bank of England sell the complete low, um, you know, and, and authority, people just completely gave up on it. Of course, then, you know, with the rise of China, gold then sort of took on a different, uh, you know, took on a different narrative. I mean, gold, gold like Bitcoin um, has different narratives that drive it at different times. Uh, it's a, it's an incredible asset in that way. Um, I would just say sort of historical predilection. Uh, it, again, a big bear market, and then people sort of having done really well in equities, right? Mm-hmm. Equities, you know, went sideways from 68 to 83, basically. So you made no money in equities for 15 years. But then look, since 1980, you've done great. And technology has come and changed everything. Um, and, you know, and driven returns in the equity market. So people haven't needed to look at gold, right? Also, in America, Americans are very comfortable with uh, equity and with their currency. So we've never really been forced to think about non-dollar uh, assets. We've never had to worry about inflation. When the dollar goes down, as it did from 2008, euro went from 80 to 160. People forget the dollar lost you know, uh, you know, whatever, 70, 80% of its value against the euro. Um, uh, uh, and has, you know, over periods of time, but it didn't hurt us. We saw it, it you know, the equity market benefited. Um, but like in foreign countries, and especially in the EM, they do have currency problems, right? They do have weak monetary policy uh, uh, people who, you know, do, you know, quasi illegal things, do, you know, uh, do actively debase their currencies. So for them, gold is more a part of their portfolio than for ours. Uh, I would say only the Germans and the Swiss really historically, uh, and then the Chinese and the Indians. Um, But, you know, I just think amongst the really big portfolios globally, you know, there just hasn't been an experience with it. And Look, even just as an example, just look on Twitter. How many true, truly smart gold advocates are there? You know, there aren't. There, I mean, of the, you know, I interviewed Tom Kaplan, uh, you know, uh, and and, and uh, John Hathaway for for Raul uh, Q4. Those are two super smart gold guys. Um, you know. They're also older people, right? I mean, you know, John's in the 70s. Tom is, you know, is is young still in his 50s. But, you know, the preeminent guys are still very old and not sort of out there getting the message out. So, look, I I think it's coming. That's when you say something like, why why has why hasn't the world put five percent or ten percent? I think there's just there's no Mr. Gold. There's no there's no Morgan Stanley of gold, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's I think that's it. There's not been an advocate. Like, imagine if gold had a guy like you, the way you advocate for Bitcoin, and throw in Michael Saylor and some of the other guys who are out there really, you know, banging the drum. Um, gold doesn't have anyone out there like that. Uh, yeah, and, so, and and I guess as you think about um, kind of. A lot of these institutions now are obviously seeing, hey, central banks are, aren't playing around, right? They're going to keep just printing and printing money. Balance sheets are going to continue to expand. There's going to be weaker currencies around the world. Um, one definitely is going to be, hey, we should put gold in the portfolio. But it sounds like you're bullish on both gold being added to the portfolio and also Bitcoin, just in yeah. different sizes. Yeah, I think I think that's right. But I also think it's for different groups of people. Okay, so- explain that. So look, I mean, if you're if you're a retail guy, uh, and you, you know you're 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 passionate about Bitcoin, and you know you think it's going to change the world, as you know as I do, um, I, I'm as bullish a, as any of those guys uh, out there pounding the table. I'm I'm just not as as loud about it. I think you know you don't you should have some gold, but you don't you don't really need it the way that larger investors really need gold now and they don't have it because in their portfolio they have a big hole right so for them they should have that five percent they should have that ten percent or even more 
and they're going to have a hard time getting the gold on. I mean, I'm sorry, getting the, the Bitcoin on. At some point in the future, when, when Bitcoin is, you know, a $5 trillion uh, asset, yeah, I think it, it becomes easier to handle, maybe even two, three, four trillion. Um, but we'll get into that. I think that's also, a, it's, it's an intellectual leap that is very hard for people to make, and we can get into that. Um, but they, I think these things coexist for a while because they're both hedges to the fiat system, right? I don't think fiat is going away anytime soon. Governments, central banks, they're not going away. I, I just, you know, control, power, they're not going to give all the, the world's uh, elite, uh, they're not giving up uh, this power just because Bitcoin is going up 20x, right? It, yep. It, it's just years and years. So, but if you don't believe in what's going on in the system, you don't have a lot of options, right? So gold will remain that an option, right? So another thing to, just to touch on is that we don't really have enough liquid stores of value available in the investment world. Mm -hmm. Look, remember, I'm coming at this from the investment perspective. You're coming at it from the tech perspective and saying gold is old tech. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. I, I, uh, it is a little, but that's not the point. The point is you don't have a hedge to the existing system at all. Look, real estate now, which many people thought you know was, is getting crushed in the cities. I mean, who even knows? I mean, eventually you know we'll get back to work in in, in that way, but it's not a great you know, maybe over a 30 year period, I guess it's a good store of value. I don't know. Um, I, I don't really know real estate that well, but. And, and is your thought, Dan, that when an institution says, hey, look, the central banks are printing tons of money, we've got to get some sort of hedge, uh, whether it's to inflation, you know, kind of the whole story. Do they look to an inflation hedge basket and then pick individual assets within the basket? Or do you think most of them are looking for more of like index-like exposure to inflation hedges? Like, like how do you think about the well, allocation decision? Well, I, I think you try to find different things that, I mean, if you're really that big, uh, you, you probably, you know, there's certain equities that'll perform, uh, you know, well, when gold performs, you know, there are miners as well. There are other things. I don't, I mean, I'm not managing a trillion dollar portfolio. I don't really worry about that. I have a, you know, I have a very large percent of DTAP, which is my own entity allocated to gold and Bitcoin. And I, I see the two together for me and I have more gold than I have Bitcoin. Um, but, you know, look, increasingly the Bitcoin side is getting much larger um, because I, I am, a, as I say in my Twitter bio, I, you know, I am a hodler of gold. Of physical and and Bitcoin, I think um, I, I um, so when I say that each person has different needs, so gold is really important to this institutional world, but they've yet to acknowledge it, right? You don't see it in the allocations yet. People don't have don't have it. The language of understanding gold is really still just in its infancy for them, right? That's why it, this coexistence ending it is, is totally off base because for these people, it hasn't even started yet. And yeah. that's why I keep saying gold and Bitcoin are like cousins because you know, it's a hard money asset in a world where for the first time in, in my career, there has never been as clear and active a, um, a debasement of fiat. Ever. I mean, yeah. in the last 30, ever. So what are you going to do against that, right? Historically, a store of value was like the yen, right? Or the Swiss franc. But no one's buying the yen anymore. That's like 15 years ago. That's the problem, is that there aren't enough safe haven options. There are not enough store of value options available to the investor. And so saying that gold is going to go away even before it started, like 
it's accept it's it's acceptance mode, right? Yeah. Like, so, so let me do this. I, I want to I want to walk through kind of step by step as to the thesis that I have as to like where I get to. Hey, they won't be coexistence, and I want to try to pinpoint the point at which we diverge in thinking because I actually think we agree on a whole lot. Yeah, at some do. point towards the end, there's this divergence, and I want to try to pinpoint that. So the way that I think about this is like. The legacy system, the central banks, like there's a bunch of problems. They're going to debase currencies and investors are going to flee to inflation hedge type assets or store value assets. I think you and I see eye to eye on that. And like right. we could literally talk for hours and hours and hours about right. all the, the problems, but we agree there. Right. And the second thing is that the solution uh, or one of the, the main solutions is going to be sound money principles. Right. And I think that then where we get to is like gold is the analog application of those sound money principles. Right. You say, hey, look, I want the physical gold. I'm going to get the gold. And I'm going to put it outside the making system. And I have control over like an analog asset that I can touch and feel. And that- right. But that's but that's me and you agreeing on that. Yes. If you were to sit in a room with more traditional that hundred trillion dollars, they may not they may not. Really? Yeah. Okay, explain not. explain why they may not agree with that. Well, look, they can see that it's happening, but they 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 they're looking at you know what are their ranges range of opportunity the the opportunity sets. They're just they've never done it before. The allocation even to gold miners, gold it's not that big. No one in that room, okay, I'll tell you this for sure, is sitting around and saying gold can be four thousand in five six years from now. I say that to you and you're like, yeah, that's reasonable, right? The Bitcoiners are more gold believers than everyone else outside of the Bitcoin world. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Yep. So if yeah. you come into my world, so here, I, I run the investment committee for an endowment. Like as I do it on my, you know, as part of my charitable uh, activity. It's a $500 million endowment. I've worked on it for 11 years, okay? We have an institutional advisor so we have an advisor who 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 advises over a trillion dollars in assets all right it has been extremely difficult over the years for me to get them to let us have some gold i mean we finally did about 18 months ago we went into gold they don't you know they don't recommend out front and center everyone needs some gold because of currency debasement and because bonds are at 50 basis points they are just now, in the last six to 12 months, saying maybe you should entertain some gold. So I'm seeing this from that perspective. I'm in that, yep. right? I'm really a, you know, a hedge fund uh, investor, trader, entrepreneur, but I, I span the entire realm as well as like a Bitcoiner. So I go from endowment manager to Bitcoiner. Right. I love and it. By the way, that endowment put one percent of its portfolio into Bitcoin in Q1, Q2, 19 last year. So and then that took we, we became the first uh, it was uh, well, the first endowment of its kind to own Bitcoin directly. Yeah. Uh, in it, cold it, storage. Anyway, my point is that so being in that world, none of those people re like are really saying what you've just said to me. Yeah. You agree. But so you and I see gold as this analog application of sound money principles. And then I think we see Bitcoin as like this digital application of sound money principles, right? There's yeah. the scarcity, all, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So when I look at that, I say, hey, gold and Bitcoin, right? For, for literally for years now, I've been saying gold and Bitcoin or sound money principles, whether it's the analog application or the digital one, will end up both doing well, right? Kind of what, what uh, your position is. Only recently have I changed my mind. And here are the things that I'm starting to think through. So if you look at some of the gold, right, there's gold ETF outflows on a very small basis over the last couple of weeks or months. I mean, yeah, but that's just flow. I mean. Of course, right? So, so, so there was a, a massive rise and you would expect that not everyone's going to hold all the gold forever and keep buying, right? So it doesn't just kind of go up into the right forever. There's going to be kind of these uh, yeah, uh, it always goes up and down. Of course. So, right. so that was kind of one. Two then is some of the central banks, right, have actually been a net seller of gold uh, on a very small basis again and, and only in the short term. Right? So this isn't a long-term trend. This is just recently. 
So as I started to think through this, I started to say, when these asset allocators look for those sound money principles, the big question I think is, are they going to allocate across the analog application and the digital, or are they going to pick one or the other? What I've become convinced of in the first scenario, if they pick both, then you and I are correct and like both do well, right? right? What I'm starting to become more convinced of and was kind of the, the impetus for that piece was, wait a second, they may only pick one. And if they do, I actually think they pick the digital version, not the analog version, over a right. long period of time. Not in, right, the, in they, the next three, four, five years. I'm talking yeah, over they, 30 years. At the years. moment, they can't, right? At the moment, they can't. And so and I agree, at I agree the moment, with that. It's too, it's too much of a leap. What, what I was trying to say before was that there you're so far ahead you don't realize it like gold, I, look, I completely gold agree is in the not short term even accepted in the institutional circles yet right they're going to say we need a hedge for the next 5 years to replace our bonds mm -hmm. right they can't go in and do 30 billion of bitcoin they just yep. can't do it and it would be irresponsible to own 10% or 20% of all the bitcoin outstanding and they'll drop the price up a lot. It just doesn't make sense. Before they get to a five to 10% allocation in gold, it will be years, okay, years. So okay. that's why, now if you're telling me in 50 years from now, people will have more Bitcoin than gold, I mean, I think, sure, it could be, maybe. But so here, here's hold on my, one second, hold okay. on one second, because I played that thought out as well, mm -hmm. reading your piece. I said, so 50 years from now, I have a different thought than you do. Okay, because, this is what I want to hear is, what do you yeah, think happens over a long period? 50 years from now, every single asset will be on the blockchain. Every financial asset, whether it's on you know, the Bitcoin network or whether something in the future happens or whatever it is, I, I, I don't know. Um, but everything will be digital. Every, everything of extreme value. Right, we love Bitcoin because of its intense security. It's unhackable. If you want to do, you know, for large transactions, eventually the collateral of the system, everything we yep. agree on all of that. Okay. The one thing is that maybe in that time, 50 years from now, there might actually be a premium for physical gold because it won't be on the blockchain. Physical gold will be physical, it won't be tracked. So you forget everything, every Bitcoin, everyone knows every, where it, it's, it's completely known. And the tax authorities are also going to know. And governments are going to know. And everyone's going to know. Okay? But they're not going to know on gold. Okay? And they still don't know on gold. And physical gold, I'm talking about. Forget ETF and futures and all that. There might be a premium because 50 years from now, physical gold will be the only liquid asset that is not digital. Now, some of it will be digitized, you know, like the Pax Gold token could have yeah. uh, 50 billion on it eventually or whatever it is. Um, but that to me also in my mind is like, I, I think that physical gold is completely anonymous if you want it to be. And physical gold is not considered a security also. So the regulations around physical gold and the taxation principles are different. There is a chance that in the future, when Bitcoin becomes an established thing and everyone has it and it's trading at four or 500,000, you know, government may say, yeah, we want to tax. You guys have made $10 billion. We're going to tax Bitcoin to 50%, right? It's, they'll know it. There'll be a record of it. Physical gold is different. And I'll tell you why. And this isn't about evading taxes. That's a, no, I'm not talking about that. There are different taxation laws for physical in different jurisdictions. As an example, in the UK, if you are a UK citizen, you can buy their sovereign coins, okay, the UK sovereign coins, and they're pretty liquid and pay no tax ever. No capital gains, no income, no wealth, no inheritance, nothing. They're grandfathered in, zero tax forever. So that's a nice way, yeah, I know, that's, that's one thing. 
There are many things like that around the world for physical gold. Okay, I'm not going to get into them, but because it's an old asset, um, because in certain places they try to encourage a, a ownership of gold, um, again, that can change. But remember, in 50 years from now, uh, there could be that premium, right? Because it'll be something that is not known if you want it to be not known, right? So that's, uh, you know, that's something you should think about. I mean, I, I don't think it, it plays into any, you know, any, anything that impacts my decision making um, because I think it's still early for both assets. Absolutely. And so when you think about kind of the asset allocation, whether it's for maybe we'll do a retail investor and then a large institution between Bitcoin and gold, if somebody called you up and they said, hey, you know, I've got some money uh, in my personal account, what do you suggest that allocation or what do you see people doing there? And then if a big institution called, how do you see that asset allocation between Bitcoin and gold? Yeah, I mean, look, uh, I think institutions should have somewhere between five and 10% in gold. And then I kind of use a, like a three to one ratio. Um, you know, that's what, I, that's what I, so if you have, if you have 10% in gold, 3% in Bitcoin, mm -hmm. um, if you're a retail person, depending on your age, like, I think you can have, you know, you can have 20% in Bitcoin. If you're a 30 year old, uh, guy, uh, zero in bonds, like zero, you yeah. should not own any bonds at all. Zero. So yeah. I think, um, yeah, I mean, I think. You know, but everyone has different risk appetite. It's hard to say. I mean, I've heard you say you're 80% in Bitcoin or whatever it is. You know, I, again, I, I, it, that's, uh, I really am from sort of the, the Druckenmiller camp of I like to put all my eggs in one basket and then watch that basket very carefully. Um, it's just a macro, you know, a macro guy uh, a focus. Um, you know, I want to be in the fastest horse. So my guess is, is look, I think Bitcoin outperforms gold tremendously. There could come a point, you know, maybe not too far in the future where my Bitcoin and gold is the same, right? Because I'm not trading. It's growth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, um, I think I like Wences Casares's, you know, 1% for institutions to dip their toe in. So I think at the very beginning, they should have 1%. And then it increases with comfort. Um, but if someone just calls me up randomly, they're you know uh, 40 years old and uh, they have no Bitcoin they want to buy, I just say 5%. I also like this exposure, and you're probably not aware of this. I'm launching a fund uh, at the end of next month called 10T, and I have a bunch of partners, and we're buying uh, private equity stakes uh, in mid to late stage companies in the digital asset ecosystem. So some of the companies that even that you own, I would own, you know, let's say figure, I know you've been a big proponent. I think that that's a fantastic company to own. Um, you know, Kraken and Paxos right now are doing raises. Uh, you know, I think those are two excellent companies. So I would, uh, I, so after my uh, Bitcoin exposure, I say to people, I have, would have half in Bitcoin and then half in this type of, of fund. The infrastructure. Yeah, because I do believe that, um, you know, central bank currencies, whether you like them or not, they're coming. Um, you know, DeFi, stable coins, that entire world, whatever you think about it or not, uh, there is going to be a world where everything will be digitized. And there are companies that are facilitating that. And, um, and also actually facilitating commerce. Um, it's not just you know, the trading volumes, it's actual commerce that will be um, completely digitized. So I think that that for me is, is, is also a, a chunk of that exposure. Um, and I think as some of these companies come public, people will start to allocate to some of these uh, businesses. You know, Coinbase might be an IPO right in Q1. Um, I think, uh, and we've, yeah, go ahead. 
And I was going to ask, how, how do you think about um, gold, Bitcoin, and that infrastructure? So I, it, it tends to be when Bitcoin's price rises, obviously a lot of the infrastructure companies do really well as well because there's just more trading volumes, the price goes up, all that yeah. kind of stuff. How, how do you think about kind of this recent short-term divergence between gold and Bitcoin, right around like the correlations and things oh, like that? I, see, I, I don't think you can trade this thing. Look, I followed markets and traded markets for years. And you know, there's a lot of time and, and brain damage that's that's done with people trying to figure out, you know, day-to-day -day moves and this thing moved and that thing didn't. This is this is much bigger than that. I mean, Bitcoin, um, you you know, I, I don't think you can trade it. I think there's too much risk that you miss, you know, a thousand point move at one in the morning and it never comes back, you know, or a you know. It, 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 all the all the math and studies have shown you really get paid when you hold this thing. Uh, it's up 250% annualized for the last 10 years. Why would you ever trade it, right? And and you have two massive down years. So I don't. I I believe you know people can do what they want. And if you're 26 years old and you know you love you know the action and you're kind of a gambler and you want to trade Bitcoin, that's great. I mean that's great. But in terms of building wealth uh, in Bitcoin and gold as well, it's just not, <clears throat> you know, you're not going to make that money at the end. And I don't want to pay short-term capital gains tax, right? You want to pay the, as long, you know, you want to pay that long-term capital gains tax rate. So, uh, you know, that, that plays into this too, right? If you, all that trading, you're paying, you know, you're paying uh, income. I mean, rates, it's cr crazy. Um, I, I couldn't agree more. Help me understand in terms of the sentiment right now you're hearing from the institutional world uh, around uh, gold and Bitcoin. It sounds like you're bullish on that sentiment being more open to adding exposure to gold, and you think that'll kind of continue uh, in the coming years. And then what about Bitcoin in terms of same there, just on a smaller scale? No, I, I, I don't think people are there. I mean, like, you know, as I said, uh, I, I've been speaking to a lot of institutional investors um, about this this fund that I'm launching. And of course, you talk about Bitcoin a lot uh, when you talk about digital asset ecosystem and the, as you call the the infrastructure around uh, around it. And you know, there's there are a lot of a lot of people out there who who won't even discuss it. So they're just like, we don't believe in crypto. Is their comment? And they haven't. They haven't done the work. They don't know what the white paper is. They don't know, you know, they don't, they don't know. Um, even look, honestly, even, um, you know, even someone like I was listening to Druck on CNBC and he says, look, it's a store of value for millennials and for uh, people in Silicon Valley and they're making a lot of money. And I think, you know, it's a, it's a good bet in that way. Um, he didn't come out and say, I believe this is a great store of value. He didn't come out and say, you know, this is the security network. This is the money protocol for the internet. He didn't say any of those things. So my guess is he's not, he's not even really committed in a big, big way. Not like Michael Saylor. I mean, he's, he's unbelievable. I mean, you know, fantastic that he's getting out there every single day. That he's bought six hundred million dollars of Bitcoin. I mean, he's he's a huge shot in the arm uh, for the space. Um, you know, I think we're all just grateful to have him. Uh, but again, he comes from a technologist background. He's not he's not from the investment background. Now he's thinking about things in an interesting way. The way he thinks about inflation and depreciation of his assets, and he has his hurdle rate is fifteen percent because, in a way, U.S. equity kind of functions as U.S. fiat, right? And so he's like, well, if, if fiat is being debased at a dollar could go down 15% a year for five or six years, I'm assuming, you know, the equity will continue up. I'm losing my purchasing power. So, I mean, I think he thinks about it that in the right way, but that is very innovative. That is not normal, right? And if you have even someone like a Druck and some of the other guys not quite all in like that i mean 600 million is a really i mean that is one that's a big statement right yeah. to do that now it's not like the winklevoss who have had 
you know, a billion plus or whatever for years and years. And there are a handful of guys like that. This is a guy who allocated it basically, you know, now, right? So it's, you know, at 10,000. Um, you know, it's a very powerful statement and his reasoning, I think, is, is phenomenal. Um, but he also attacks gold. And he says it's dangerous to think about gold and Bitcoin together. And that's actually not right. I mean, maybe within the framework of a, of a tech, uh, in a, a tech a background person. But if you are an investor, okay, you haven't come to the conclusion most, that you've come to yet. Many have, some have, but again, you're just seeing the smartest guys in the world coming to it now. Tudor's piece was just last summer. It didn't come out five years ago. Druck was just on CNBC last week. Those are the smartest guys in the space in the world, right? And Dalio, he's not even there yet. He wants to be, he wants to be taught. He's asking you on, you know, Twitter, maybe, you know, you and, you and Sailor uh, sit him down. I mean, so, and he is at the cutting edge apex, really, of that traditional world. So that just shows you how far away. They're not even there yet. They don't even know how to think about it yet. Yeah. So I just, I have a, like a, a different perspective and I don't think it's dangerous to think about gold and Bitcoin. I think that gold in a way, I don't want to say it's like the gateway drug to Bitcoin, because, but it kind of is the gateway. And it seems obvious to you, but it's not really that. Yeah. Prevalent. How do you think about stock to flow? Obviously, that's been a very popular uh, thing in the gold world or used in the gold world previously, uh, and, and now has been um, kind of applied to Bitcoin. Uh, is that something that in the gold world, you put uh, kind of weight on, um, or do you no, not I mean, really? Look, I mean, I, I think it's fine. I like it. I, uh, he has an RSI that he puts out, a relative strength index in connection with his model, you know, a hundred trillion, and, and, and the, the, the stock to flow model that I think is great because when it's low, that's when you're supposed to buy. When it's high, you're supposed to sell. But it, it works over years, and it's it's had a very good tracking. We're right in the middle now, and I think I put a tweet out last week about it. So I like it, but in some ways, it's a relatively, I don't want to say simplistic model. Um, there's a lot more that goes into making decisions about assets. So yeah, I look at that, but I also look at 50 other things before making a decision, um, and I look at the gold, uh, uh, where gold is on, and I'm like, yeah, I, I'm aware of that, but you know, drilling down into the supply demand uh, mechanics of gold is probably is a lot more important. You know, we don't have a lot of gold coming online. Um, I don't want to say we have peak gold, but supply will decline over the next, you know, three four years, um, and that just tells me that price is going to have to go up a lot to encourage uh, a lot more um, exploration and um, and excavation. So I I like it, but it's just one input. And I, I think people in the Bitcoin space, again, a lot from a technologist background, aren't used to doing the deep, deep 50 page analysis on an investment, you know, which is normally what we do. You know, I, you know, ordinarily I would have, you know, between four and eight research analysts we will spend months writing uh, a, a presentation or an idea out before taking a position. That's months of digging. It's not just, here's the model we're going to buy. I mean, no one does that. In the, <laughs> no one who's, who's long for this world does that, right? So it's just a nice input. I think he, he got attacked a little bit recently. I just, it's because, you know, th eventually there'll be a lot more work like that. I think Nick Carter does tremendous work. I mean, Couldn't I agree he, more. Tremendous work. Um, you know, so I, I yeah. Let, let's talk a little bit about Twitter before I let you go. Just in terms of Twitter is where uh, kind of the the community is, where the conversation is. Um, you mentioned earlier this idea of uh, privacy and how privacy used to be a big thing, but is quickly not becoming a big thing uh, in the investment world. Talk a little bit about this. Well, no, no, no. I yeah, I think. Look, as I said, I think 
you know, in the first 20 years of my career, you basically, as I said, you, you, you know, you'd get fired for talking to the press and people didn't talk to the press and uh, it just, you just didn't, you focused on your ideas and your portfolio and, you know, and moved on. But I think that, I think that's sort of a very, you know, almost it's, it's, it feels to me old and archaic. I try to move away from things that are old uh, because they don't evolve. And, you know, the, 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 the concept of complete 100% privacy, uh, I, I just, I don't want to say I see it going away, but it's just that, look, there's, a, you get, a, you get quite a benefit from these interactions as well. Uh, so you have to give up a little bit uh, of privacy. Um, look, Metcalf's law is something real. And here's something that um, investment guys, macro investment guys especially, don't really get as much. Like they don't really get the network value, for instance, of Bitcoin. Like it doesn't really make sense. Like where's the cash flow? Well, there's no cash flow. But, but the network is expanding at a, at a crazy fast rate, right? So it's the, sort of the same thing with Bitcoin. I mean, with Twitter, I mean, I guess the, the hive mind concept that, you know, you get so much from interactions. Again, 50, 70% of it, you know, can be garbage, but 10, 20% of it is really good. And there are people out there, um, you know, who may not necessarily be, you know, well-known uh, fund managers or even necessarily that successful, but who can have great ideas. And so this is a forum, you know, this is a forum for that. Um, just, I, I don't, I don't know. The old, the old guys are just, I, I, I think they're just uncomfortable giving up a little bit of that privacy. And I think the benefits are great. And also it's becoming a little weird to be a hermit, you know? I mean, e even uh, if you're, it's just weird. If you don't have, you know, if you're not on any social media anywhere, people think you're hiding something or what, even though you may not be. Um, so anyway, I, 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 like, I like the interaction. Lots of smart people from all over the world who you'd never get to interact with. Um, and, you know, I, I just, I, I uh, make liberal use of that, uh, of that blocking function as well because I don't really like cursing or personal attacks or people who are too emotional about all this. I like, you know, it just life's too short. And I like to read my threads, I like them to be clean. I like to go back and look at them, you know, uh, you know, have conversations sometimes with some people's comments. So you don't want a lot of, you know, crazy. Nonsense. Yeah, right. I mean, you know, some people like it. I, I yeah. Uh, absolutely. Hey, before I let you go, let's talk a little bit just about uh, when you zoom all the way out and you see gold and Bitcoin um, and kind of the institutional world, what is your, maybe not prediction, but just what's your sense of like how this plays out? We, you know, let's go 10 years from now. Do majority of institutions have exposure to gold and 20% have exposure to Bitcoin uh, and they're at that kind of 10% and 3% you mentioned? Like, like, how do you think this plays out, let's say, through the 2020s? Where, where do we end up? Um, I think we'll get to a place. So you're saying 10 years or not. I mean, this is hard. I, look, I think we get to a place where people have between, you know, these big institutions call it, I could see 10% in, in gold and five in Bitcoin, and some might reverse that. The more speculative uh, guys who are used to investing in uh, venture capital as well, you know, they could have maybe 10%, uh, 15%. Um, you know, it'll eat away a little bit at people's equity allocations and a little bit at, um, you know, and of course the bonds will be at zero. So, um, you know, that's a huge, huge chunk. I mean, 15% of, uh, you know, 100 trillion, right, is 15 trillion. That could be 15 trillion to flow, to yeah. flow into, um, or more. I mean, I, I think it'll eventually be more because, look, for me, Bitcoin, we didn't talk about this, but I is much bigger than gold, all right? Bitcoin is, you know, it could be, and I, I think will be that value protocol for the internet. 
Gold is a store of value. Bitcoin is an entire network, right? One aspect of what Bitcoin is, is a store of value. That's another reason I don't understand all the, the constant comparisons to gold because you're limiting what it is. And if you say to an investor, oh, it's just digital gold, they're like, no, it's not. And that's it. But if you say to them, this is an invention akin to the invention and discovery of electricity or the invention of the combustible engine, then they're like, what are you talking about? It's just digital gold, you said. No, it's not. That's one little aspect of what Bitcoin is. So I think that people in the space who harp on this comparison are, you know, at least for the bigger investment world, they're not telling the story the right way. This Satoshi's white paper solved the Byzantine general's problem. That's a big deal. No one else was able to solve that problem. The mechanics of how Bitcoin works is very complex, but it's an unbelievable creation. Gold is not that creation. Gold is important as a, in the investment world as a store of value and a hedge against the fiat. Bitcoin is bigger than, you know, it could be a system that grows up that's equal in size to the entire legacy system. Mm -hmm. So I don't know why people don't, focus on that aspect more the yeah. you know the 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 collateral for the new system right the i mean all of those bigger things like the security look it turns what have we had that turns energy into security right gold doesn't turn gold actually does turn a little bit of energy into security because it takes a lot of energy to produce a bar of gold and gold is very secure you know, Brinks vaults have never been violated. I mean, it's a lot more secure than I think the Bitcoiners understand. But look, it's not this unbelievable, almost like machine, this mechanism. Okay, investors don't get there because they stop at, oh, it's it digital. Well, maybe, but maybe not. If they were to understand what it actually is, right? A, this bulletproof security truth mechanism. You know, you know, I have real estate investors, especially coming to me, trying to understand this because they think, you know, you probably see this with some of your companies. They think that um, eventually all the transactions that get done, you know, are put on some blockchain or are put on the Bitcoin network or however, you know, I mean, that would be transformative. There's 100, 200, 100 trillion in, in real estate assets around the world. Imagine if, you know, that were all on the Bitcoin network. I, I'm just saying you can't do that with gold, right? Absolutely. Gold is not that. So, you know, Bitcoin is much bigger. It's yeah. a much bigger it, thing. It's a very nuanced So I'm going to ask you this question. Okay. Why do guys in the space not push that message out there? I, obviously, I can't speak for everybody. I do think that uh, one is um, there's a group of people who don't believe that, right? I'm with you. I believe it, but I think that- What don't people, they believe? What don't they believe? I, I think there's some people who literally just think it's digital gold and they talk about it that way, right? Now, maybe that's a small group, but there's definitely some people who just think that. Then there's a group of people who believe kind of- But wait, wait a second, Anthony, hold on a second, because there aren't even that many people who really believe in gold. And so you're telling me that guys are like, okay, it's digital gold and that's it. And, and, th and then they move on. So well, I, I think <laughs> put in that bucket, I think what ends up happening is there's a lot of people who would have been gold bugs, right? Like, like a, a group of people who naturally would, they're just much younger. Okay. And so they hear right. Bitcoin, right? Okay. And, and so like, right. and again, it may be a small group, but there's definitely that group. Then there's a group of people who have a belief in that bigger vision but they're scared to talk about it. So what do they Why? do is they, they basically just say, oh, it's digital gold. They explain it on a smaller scale because they think that the group that they're talking to will uh, be more receptive to that, right? It's kind of like if you walk in and, uh, and you pitch Amazon in 1994 right. and you say, right. uh, we're going to be the largest company in the world. Everyone goes, right. good luck, kid, right? If you say, right. hey, we're going to sell books on the internet, I'll give you some money for that, right? No, right, but on Twitter, people can voice their opinions as they like. 
why doesn't this message get out there? I mean, Antonopoulos and some things, especially his older YouTubes, he gets into this, the Safadine Amos uh, book, he gets into sort of a bigger vision. Um, you know, there, there are other books and articles out there, but, you know, I don't, you know, I, I don't really get it because it is that mechanism, right? It's the functioning, you know, figuring out how the miners work and the node operators and the, this proof of work algorithm. Maybe those words just scare people. I don't know. Yeah, it, it's definitely part of it. And then I think that there's actually a big group of people who believe exactly what you just said about like yeah. the really big opportunity, right? And I'm one of right. them, you're one of them and, and all of that. Because I think you hold a very nuanced view, right? It's um, it's a view of uh, gold and Bitcoin will coexist. Bitcoin will have a larger market cap over a long period of time, but well, gold may, market cap will it, also it increase. May, like 50 years from now. Or yeah, yeah a, a, a like, very long period of time. Yeah. It, and, yeah. And, and then on top of that, that doesn't necessarily mean as Bitcoin's market cap grows, that gold's market cap goes down. They actually may grow in lockstep. Well, they will grow in lockstep. And for the next 10 years, many institutions have no alternative. They need this in their portfolio, the gold. So I think it's like growing together, as you say, for at least 10 years, uh, you know, at, at least. I mean, I, but Bitcoin will be the fastest horse. Yeah. And, and look, sure. I, I, th I think that that's probably one of the most rational views of how this plays out, uh, yeah. especially over 10 years, right? Like, like I tend to think that that is probably more right than wrong. Uh, and the big question is just going to be what's it take to get the, you know, $800 billion, trillion dollar asset managers to start putting gold in there and, and, uh, and Bitcoin as well, right? I think right. it's, I think it's more of the same you know, this balance sheet expansion, you know, moving to negative rates. Uh, I'm shocked that it's actually taken so long, to be honest, because Europe and Japan have had negative rates. Uh, you know, you actually get paid to own physical gold uh, if you're borrowing at that negative rate. So there's no storage fee at all. Um, I'm just surprised it's, you know, it's, it's taking this long for this wholesale adoption. But look, people get used to patterns of behavior and get used to assets. And look, uh, price goes up helps in gold too, right? It's <laughs> not just, it's not just uh, uh, Bitcoin. Yeah. I love it. All yeah. right. I asked the same question to everyone, uh, two questions before uh, I wrap up and you'll get to ask me one. The first is what's the most important book that you've ever read? Ooh. God, there are a few. Um, someone asked me about this recently. Um, I should have, uh, well, a book that I recommended recently to somebody that is certainly in my top five is The Rebel by Camus. Why do you so, like that one? Yeah, that, I mean, it's, it's sort of the best, uh, you know, intellectual history of a Western philosophy. So I, I did a BAMA in history at Brown. So I, I've always sort of tended towards history and philosophy. And um, I think there's a, a really great personal message there. I mean, that book, um, yeah, that book's been very important to me. Yeah. I love it. Second question is more I fun. also like, oh, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. What, what was your I second? I was going to say, you know, for the for this crowd, though, a little more. I mean, I also love The Fountainhead. Um, you know, that was a key book when I was younger that I, you know, kind of, you know, I, there are aspects of that that I love, some not so much, but I can remember uh, that had a, a profound effect on me when I was young, too. So I love it. Second question is more fun. Aliens. Are you a believer or a non-believer? Aliens. Uh yeah, I think the probability is there's something out there. I mean, you know, look, uh, there are hundreds of billions of galaxies, right? Hundreds of billions. At some point, some molecules must have come together, you know. Just that's probability. My, yeah, I, I just, the, the odds are there. Uh, it, it might take us another billion years to know it, 
right? I mean, yeah. you don't know, but when you ask an open-ended question like that, I think the odds are are there. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Aliens, I completely agree. One. What uh, what one question do you have for me to finish up? Um, <clears throat> how the hell do you uh, do all the stuff that you do? <laughs> I just don't understand it. I, you're on Twitter. It's you know 2 a.m. and then you write the newsletter and that comes out and then you're, you know, you're you're involved in an offering of a. You're just I. I, I what's your workout regimen? Because that's that for me is what keeps everything together. Yeah. So uh, over time, I've gotten hyper efficient with my time and I basically have like blocks on my schedule of I know okay now switch context like working on this, working on that. Uh, so that definitely helps. Uh, from a workout standpoint, um, I have spent a ton of time trying to optimize sleep. And right. what I found is- I have too. It's very important. Yeah. And, and what I found is uh, working out is the key to sleep. So what I, the way I think about it is like, I want to do enough physical activity every day to tire myself out so that I sleep well at night. Yeah. Um, and uh, usually that can be anywhere between like, 35 to an hour and a half. Uh, one of the hacks in quarantine has been uh, every day, I, every, every day. day, yeah, every, every day. day. You don't uh, miss a day. Uh, I, I mean, I might miss a day like here or there randomly, right. but but n nothing. I don't try uh, to miss a day. Um, but the other thing that I've uh, started doing that is really helpful is uh, when I'm taking calls, I'll go on walks. So I may end up right. some days, I may go, you know, and have walked for two hours outside uh, right. and then I'll come and I'll like finish, you know, working out or whatever. Yeah, um, but you're not that old a guy to be like going on walks. I mean, like you could, what are you, 37, 38, 39? 32. 32. You should be, I mean, walks. I mean, you should be on the, uh, on the treadmill hitting it hard or... Yeah, but if uh, I'm on the phone, up a sweat. Yeah, no, if I'm I, on the phone, I, I guess you're right. Right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. when I'm not on the phone, I'm not yeah. going on walks. But if I'm right. on a phone call, right. basically it's a way to kind of be hyper efficient with my time, right? Get the right. call done and also some physical activity. So yeah, it's uh, it's not. So bad. you're you're just multitasking through it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's all. No, no. Yeah. No, no. no, no. I presume you see yourself in this business for the next, you know, twenty years. I'm just I mean, having fun. Yeah, no, me too. I, I mean, I think this is going to be my focus for, you know, the next 10 years plus this world. Yeah. Um, I don't see, and I don't see anything with as much asymmetry to the upside, right? Nothing. I mean, nothing, right? It's so early still. It's going to be, uh, uh, it's going to be fun. That's for yeah, sure. Where, yeah. where can I send people to find you on the internet or find out well, Twitter. what you're working on? Just send them to Twitter? Yeah. I mean, DTAP cap uh, is from... I'm, I'm not on LinkedIn. It's so funny. I get like all these requests every day, but I don't do it because I was never a guy that did that. I was not a, a going out meeting clients. You know, I was an investor. So I just never got around to doing that. Uh, and Twitter, I'm on, Twitter's way better. Twitter's well, what LinkedIn should Bloomberg. have been anyways. Of course I'm on Bloomberg, but you know, that sort of dates me, right? Like I can't live without my, it used to be Bloomberg was the cutting edge I used to transact over Bloomberg yep. where I would just send it a message and say, you know, buy this uh, crazy. today. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. So now it's all Twitter. It's all, all right, Twitter. my friend. Listen, okay, thank good. you so much really for Really good doing chatting. It. Absolutely. You are an absolute legend and I appreciate the time. We will definitely have to do this again in the future. L yeah. I love this. I, I had some points I didn't make that maybe I'll make next time and uh, have a good Thanksgiving and congratulations uh, as a newlywed. <laughs> Thank you right? very much. That's, I appreciate that's it. That's a lot of fun. <laughs> All right, Dan. Thank Enjoy. you so much. See you.